We're going to have eight wines, so we're going to have two pairs of, uh, of wines followed by two pairs of wines. So the first set of wines you have, just sort of we're all in the same uh, game of play, will be two Rieslings. Um, and those will follow on your handouts that you got this morning. And those will be followed by two Pinot Gris. Then we'll sort of talk while they're dumping and pouring for the next set of wines. And we will ultimately conclude with a pair of Gewürztraminers and a pair of uh, Muscats as well, too, um, which will sort of uh, delve onto the theme a little bit more here, which is exactly that. Uh, the theme of this program is indeed called Grand Cru Grapes Globally Interpreted. So this is ultimately what we hope to be sort of a culmination on what we built on today. So we just came off a little bit uh, talking and tasting some Alsace wines and doing that. John and his panel did an extraordinary um, job this morning, really saying just about everything there was to say about Riesling, so I won't spend that much time on it uh, when we get there. But what we, I thought it would be fun would be um, to take, you know, when you talk about Alsace, when you talk about their great grapes, we'll get into this in more in just a couple of minutes, um, you know, they have lots of, of grapes, but four of them have over time, and we're, when we're talking about over time here, you know, we're talking about literally hundreds and hundreds of years, have sort of self-selected themselves as being the noblest of grapes. And noble in the world of grapes, you know, makes a lot of sense in the uh, context of Alsace, but, uh, this one, yeah. but um, you know, it's important to sort of put that in the way. You know, we're going to focus on four grapes here, but, you know, John talked a little bit about more of this this morning. We looked at all the white wine grapes, but I thought it would just be fun to sort of share however grapes there are. If you picked up, which if you don't own and you don't want to schlep around a 40-ton book, at least download a Kindle version of it, uh, Jancis Robinson and Julia Harding and Jose Guillemos' book, Wine Grapes, there are 1,368 grapes out there that are used at some level in the production of making wine. 700 of those, if you take the courage to do so and crack the cover, are elaborated on in text. Um, roughly 150 of these are planted commercially uh, in quantities around the world to make wine from. But the reality is, and I think um, you know, we kind of alluded to this over the morning, is that there's only about four or five dozen of them that are consumed con commercially by Americans. And when you really delve down to that, it's probably more like eight or ten that we consume on a regular basis. We're going to focus on, frankly, four of those today uh, in the world of white wines um, with what we're doing with, with Grand Cru. So we're going to talk about that more in a second. I'll talk a little bit about the Grand Cru system because I think it's important that you understand that. If you don't know where you're going, all roads will get you there. So it's important that we establish that. Um, we're going to flip-flop this tasting around and the discussion a little bit more, and I'll explain that. Um, momentarily, but that's just sort of the uh, the play of what we're going to do. Um, so just to give us a sense here, I just gave a list down of um, of a bunch of white wine grapes that we find there. It's important to note that 90% of all the wine produced um, in Alsace, that would be from the dessert wines to the cremant to the, to the still wines, table wines, are made from white wine grapes. That's probably not astonishing to some of you, maybe astonishing to some of you. It's probably most astonishing to me because that means that there's about 10% that are made from Pinot Noir or red wine grapes too. But the lion's share of what we associate in this part of the world is white. And when we speak to the noble varieties, those that are allowed to be used for the production of Grand Cru, that would simply be four. And those would be Riesling, Gewürztraminer, Muscat, and Pinot Gris, although other grapes like Pinot Blanc, which also goes by Clevner, Auxerrois, which occasionally is confused with Pinot Blanc, Sylvain, Chasselas, etc. Lots of different grapes there. And even grapes like Chardonnay and such are planted there, although legally not able to be bottled under varietal names, um, too. Then the system itself is pretty cool. And how many of you are actually familiar with the Grand Cru system as it pertains to Alsace? Raise your hand. How many of you are not? Which is okay too. Raise your hand. How many of you would just like a beer right now? You've had enough of that wine this morning. You're a great man at microbrew beer. Give me a give me an A. Okay. Well, let's talk about it. The system of the Alsace Grand Cru. It's important to remember that this part of the world, which is we know, sort of is in the northeast of, of France, flanking Germany, and depending on what year you are, maybe part of Germany because it's gone back and forth as we know over centuries. Um, is an area that sort of shares at once both parts of the culture. Because of this ongoing back and forth part, they've been kind of a little bit like the ugly redheaded stepchild there, in that their wine culture was not as embraced early on. They were amongst the last region of France to have an official appellation system um, put down to them, despite the fact, as I mentioned earlier, grapes go back um, for, for centuries, and in fact, many of the best sites, the 51 Grand Cru Vineyard sites that we use, 
for uh, the Grand Cru system are, are known since literally the 14th century. Um, so the system itself was established in 1975 with an initial selection of roughly uh, two dozen grape uh, uh, vineyards. It's been expanded, as you know, uh, since 1983 when it was activated to 51 vineyards these days. Some people will tell you 52, some people will tell you 50, it is 51. And there are various different criteria that are um, considered within that. First of all, we sort of established one that there are only the four varietals that are used. Within those, to make a wine from a Grand Cru uh, classification status, there are certain um, expectations that you have, which is to say they've got minimal sugar levels, they've got minimal ABV levels that are there, mandated low yields, um, uh, they must list the vineyard on the label, etc. So very much as is the French, and also obviously um, deferring to their Germanic neighbors, very, um, uh, dictated about how you go about things. Uh, again, the four grape varieties. But the vineyard itself also has to have certain additional criteria that is quote unquote understood. Criteria number one is that it should yield superior wines. Well, duh, that makes sense on a cruise system. Number two, that it should have some historical relevance that should be understood for an extended period of time, um, either as a, uh, probably mostly what we would consider, if you know the French term, lieu dit, or spoken place, um, a lot of the UDs that even are not classified are still renowned as having a great historical value to them. Um, they should be re reasonably homogeneous across the vineyard. And probably the most important thing to me is that they should have more than one owner, uh, which is to say that various different people, much along the way of the Grand Cru in Burgundy, are able to produce superlative wine, superlative wine out of the same vineyard. Um, so that would be great. But there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of naysayers out there. There's a lot of people who want to puncture uh, holes into their Winster, if you will, to do that. So first of all, not everybody who has the right to be involved chooses to be involved. There are people that have the ability, because they work out of a particular vineyard, to put Grand Cru on the label, but they decide for whatever reason not to. Um, that could be because they have their own name that goes back that they like to do for a long period of time. It's like these sort of so-called Yudis, um, Clos Antune from Trimbach would be, a, would be a great example of a wine that has the capacity to label itself as a Grand Cru, but has chosen not to. Um, the whole residual sugar discussion, I think the third wine that we just had in that last um, presentation was a great example that, you know, um, how sweet are they these days? In fact, there's lots of rumblings in Alsace that, you know, they should really be dry and exclusively dry, and if it's going to have sugar, it has to be a Vendage Tardive or a Selection de Grand Noble, but to just simply label it by the varietal name and have that much residual sugar, maybe not such a good thing. Um, so that's a big thing. And then also, you know, one of the neat things about Alsace is that they've always had um, Grand Cru um, panel classification. So you know that somebody's actually tasted it, approved it, and said, yes, indeed, this is representative of what a Grand Cru is all about. Well, these people have not been known to be 100% accurate at all times. Some people will take a little money under that, I don't know. But um, needless to say, that's an issue. And then there are, of course, exceptions to the, to, to the rules, such as the, you know, 2006, they decided that the Sylvaner could be a Grand Cru coming out of the Zotzenberg vineyard. So again, lots of opportunities for Swiss cheese. So just something to think about as we do that, despite the fact we're not going to be in Alsace today. So before we actually start tasting, we were supposed to, have, my envisioning of this, for those of you who are, um, you know, I go back to the period of like, you know, Pteranodons and short arm dinosaurs, and one of my favorite things growing up was watching Monday Night Football, right? Howard Cosell, Dandy Don, and Frank Gifford. So I had this great idea that I would, I would be Howard Cosell, and I would have my, my, my two panelists there today. Well, unfortunately that flanked off on me yesterday when uh, Haley um, called up and informed me that she was really sick and uh, she was not going to be able to join us. So we tried to punt on the spot and, and find somebody to be probably arguably Frank Gifford between the three of us, right? Um, but we couldn't do that, so then Michael and I just decided, so now I think we're going to be, I'm going to be more like Al Michaels and you can be more like John Madden or something like that, so I'll carry it out that way. So what I wanted to do before we actually start talking and tasting, um, and I'll give you a little bit more protocol for that in a minute, is just to have Michael um, talk to you a little bit about um, what's going on. You've got Michael's bio in there, um, so I won't spend a lot of time talking about it, but I would like to point out that if you find yourself down in San Francisco, um, in some time in the not in the not too distant, or frankly even distant future, he's going to be around for a while. Uh, Michael and uh, his partner John Wong have just opened up a really hip new uh, super local wine bar 
uh, in the inner Richmond of San Francisco on uh, Clement at 6th Avenue. So if you're looking for a neat array of wines and ciders, I might add too, at really good reasonable prices, um, food menu uh, forthcoming and all that, and are just kind of wanting to, a wine bar to kind of make your own in San Francisco, it's called High Trees, and I'll let him tell you a little bit more about that. But um, Michael, you want to give us your, tell us a little bit about High Trees and give us your thoughts on just these great varietals and Alsace and all that. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, so yeah, a little bit about High Treason. Um, basically, I, I think you do have my bio in front of you. So my partner and I um, spent a lot of years working as our restaurants and you know, tie on every night and that sort of thing. And uh, we just kind of realized at one point that that really isn't really where we came from. You know, we love great wine, we love classic service, but it was just not really us at the end of the day. So we decided to create a place that we really enjoyed. And so it's a very warm, welcoming, casual place with you know high level of service and some really fantastic wines. Um, so you can come there and short some flip flops and drink Romney Conti and listen to the Beastie Boys. It's, it's, it's wonderful. Oh, I would say um, thank you for the John Madden thing. I, I feel a little slimmer than that, but uh, I am a Raider fan, so I'm happy with that. Um, so yeah, come down uh, and you know, see us in high treason when you, when you get a chance. Um, you know, regarding Alsace, uh, for me, um, you know, growing up on a skateboard in San Jose, you know, having that sort of perception of Alsace, um, you know, you learn about it, you learn about the noble varietals. Um, and the one thing that really struck me kind of throughout my career learning about these wines is, uh, you know, there really are two camps, and, and Evan touched on this, really two camps of uh, styles of production. And it really does center around that, that sugar, frankly. Uh, you know, whether you have the residual sugar in the non style of wine or something, you know, bone dry like Pussy Game. Uh, so I think uh, as we're sort of vetting these wines, we can think about them in those terms. Which side of the fence do they fall on? Uh, it's a wonderful opportunity to kind of see who is approaching which iconic style for me. Uh, so this is going to be a lot of fun in terms of these eight wines. Um, another thing that kind of struck me about Alsace, and I don't know if you remember the uh, varietals uh, slide we just had a minute ago, but right at the bottom was Pinot Noir. And so we don't think about red wine in Alsace at all, frankly. Um, but with global warming, you know, temperatures creeping up, things getting a little riper, um, more knowledge about red wine making in Alsace, I think we're going to start to see some interesting, interesting Pinots coming out of there. And I think it's a place to make mine for value. Uh, one that comes to mind right away, uh, I tasted Marcel Dice's uh, Pinot recently, and it was it, fresh, bright, there's some fruit there. It's, it's a really interesting place to kind of take a look. So I would, I would encourage everyone to kind of sort that out and uh, seek it out in the future. Thank you, Michael. No, it'll be interesting, especially when we talk uh, to some of our um, uh, domestic counterparts in, 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 in uh, Michigan and in um, uh, New York State too. Oftentimes, where you see Riesling being successful, especially in these days and age of global warming, Pinots and even to a lesser degree Cabernet Franc are being successful as well too. So, what I would like to do is, as I'm starting to talk about um, the varietal in general, you're welcome to taste the pairs. So, wines one and two, as we said before, are um, both without the changes because we change structure. Are both Rieslings. Um, so let's just talk a little bit about Riesling. John did an extraordinary job this morning, so I'm not going to spend too much time there, except to note that with each slide that I go by, those that are in bright red are going to be what we're actually tasting. And I think what's probably most important, because you're all capable of reading, is to no notice a couple of things with each um, geography slide, if you will. Um, I'll stand up, although it really doesn't make that much difference, does it? I'm not <laughs> vertically challenged would be a kind way of saying it, right? But, but suffice it to say, you know, one of the things that's interesting about grapes as you move around um, is that they are wonderful expatriates. They are wonderful at going around the world and showing themselves in their finest colors in other parts of, uh, of the world, around the globe. And, and Riesling certainly um, is one of them. I thought it was really neat, um, uh, not only the info information that we learned this morning with John, but to also take sort of a very Pacific coastal approach towards what, uh, what was going on. There's obviously a couple of examples from California, uh, one from Oregon and one from Washington. But, but needless to say, um, there are some other states that are producing it as well too, and we'll talk about it. You have one um, in uh, glass number two, in fact, that is from uh, the Finger Lakes, and we'll talk a little bit more, more about, about that in the middle. An area that's actually technically closer to Toronto, by the way, than it is to New York, uh, New York City. But Michigan would be another one that probably um, will hit the uh, converged to me later, which you wouldn't know about. But suffice it to say, once you sort of hit that, that Alsace-Germany area, once again, we talked about it before, it's kind of bopped back and forth over time. It's interesting to just sort of look around the world and see other places that have done it, whether it's up our, our friends up in Canada, to continue that Pacific Coastal thing a little bit further up in the Okanagan, or 
again in Ontario, in uh, northeastern Italy they're doing it, uh, Eastern Europe, uh, Australia, um, certainly the Clare and Eden Valleys are um, emblematic for the style of Riesling today, of which class number one um, I think is a good representation of a Clare style that we'll talk about in a minute. Uh, the Adelaide Hills, etc., Tasmania, new places that they're planning it around, and then in New Zealand as well, too. Uh, we'll be trying a Pinot Gris from New Zealand, but I wouldn't um, shy away from trying some of their absolutely terrific Rieslings, particularly in Otago and in Martinborough and places like that. But South Africa, Austria, etc., needless to say, you're going to find that these grapes have been wonderful emissaries as they've moved around the world. Um, we talked a little bit about some of these things this morning, but I think one of the things that came off um, as part of it, just as a build, it would be there. Style is important. Michael underscored that. John underscored that. Our panel underscored it. And the beauty of this grape, but its challenge, its dilemma at the same time, is it can be bone dry, it can be uber sweet, it can be everywhere in between, and you don't always know exactly what it is. And we're dealing with the um, sugar level scales in, in, uh, in um, Germany, for example. You know, are two people's cabinets sugar level exactly the same? Not really. And can you make an Auschleser Trocken? Well, the answer is yes. So it gets a little bit confusing there, but needless to say, it's probably one of the most defining underlying elements of what a Riesling is to determine its style, flavor, and your, your own personal preference. Wood aging, we talked a little bit about the Fudras. There are some people there in, in, in Alsace, Ostertag and those like that who use Barique, but it's relatively minimal. Most people are playing around with, with concrete or stainless or things that are relatively inert. And then ultimately, whether you're making it sparkling or still, we think about it mostly in the context of still, but there are some sparkling reasons out there, some Zet style wines that are out there as well. And then for all of you who are familiar with it, you can copy all this down, although I'm sure John has a better set of descriptors in the book. Um, the beauty of most of these grapes, I mean, even something that's as relatively um, less forthcoming compared to, say, the Birchtermeer or Muscat like Riesling is. Needless to say, there's a lot of descriptors that are associated with it, and uh, albeit more nuanced by definition, it's a very expressive grape in its own right, depending on style. So we have two of them here. I'm going to put the, the slides up and go back and forth, but uh, Michael, you want to sort of take us through what your, your thoughts were on the two wines, and I'll jump in. And Sure, yeah. Um, so first of all, I'll point out right away, and I've been touched on this, uh, wine number one is like an iconic Australian Riesling. Like, use this, like, taste this, get into it, really understand this. This is your best. This is what we point to, frankly. Um, for me, it's always very high-toned, laser-like acid, just, it's like shooting you with a laser, right? Um, while wine number two, which is actually Asian oak, also dry, but um, comes to you more like more like a dodgeball, right? It's a little rounder, a little, little thicker, kind of hits you in more places in terms of texture. Uh, so that for me is uh, like number one, just kind of like the big difference between the two. I know everyone's a little reasoning down, so we'll, we'll go through these first two fast. Um, but any impressions uh, from anybody about the massive differences between these two or commonalities? Are we seeing kind of a, I mean, you've had a lot of reasoning today, so is there a, is there a linear kind of relationship between one, two, and, and some of the rest that you've tasted today? <laughs> I think what's interesting is that, you know, within the context of them, and, and yes, I think as Michael said before, if you can sort of um, put, a, put an imprint of what wine number one is when you're thinking about Australian Riesling, it's a really good example. Um, those particularly that are coming from the Eden tend to be a little bit more wine zesty and a little bit more... Um, uh, not necessarily as, as uh, petrally or, or, or as oily early on as say those that can get from the Claire can be, which can be a little bit riper. But it is a very, very uh, classic style. Very, again, I hate to use the word minimally driven, but they tend to have notes of that. And again, this sort of um, nuances of fusel uh, petrol that do pick up as the wines actually get older. Uh, the finger lengths um, is a very interesting area, and I don't know for those of you who just got your most recent issue of the Wine Spectator, but James Molesworth just did a whole uh, expose round two on the finger lengths, and um, unbeknownst to me, Forge, the winery that you're having today, um, was the number one wine, um, both in value and in overall score there, and I think is doing a relatively good job. As I said before, closer to Toronto than New York City, huge history. Again, if you think about the earliest um, comings of wine, admittedly with American, Native American grapes and then hybrids as they played later on, um, comes from this area. In fact, the first bonded winery um, in the United States is Pleasant Valley Winery um, in New York. Uh, which is located in uh, the Finger Lakes area, and that was back in 1860. But this recent push to fine wine um, is relatively new. Um, Riesling certainly is the leading grape variety there, but there are people playing on with other aromatic whites that are doing a good job. Um, there are lots of different interpretations. Um, this is one if you've had Ravine or you've had um, uh, 
um, Jaquivka Lake, or some of the others. There, there are lots of different things, but this one comes from Seneca Lake, um, and it is, as, as, as uh, Michael said before, aged in oak. Interesting story, two locals and a guy named Louis Bachual, who is a producer out of the Rhone Valley, uh, getting together. What would drive a producer from the Rhone Valley with two guys from New York? Who knows, but the result is what you have here, and I think uh, a nice, interesting style. Um, uh, I got as much information as I could. I wish I had the treatise on each wine that John was able to put together for his. That's what, That made me feel really, oh my god, I didn't get enough information this morning. But um, a little bit of information there, and I think the, the aging in neutral barrique certainly picks up on the texture and the richness. Yeah, and I was going to actually point that out. I should really kind of get these two. I'll just stay. <laughs> Uh, get these two in your mouth and really just feel the sort of the texture of the wine and the way the wine hits your mouth. And this really is the difference between steel, wine one, and wood in wine two. You get a slight oxidation in wine two. It kind of just rounds everything out uh, and really kind of fills up the mouth where, you know, again, wine number one, again, like that laser. Uh, both these wines are going to age wonderfully. And, like, so <laughs> buy a bunch of them land down because they're not super expensive. Yeah, they're tangy and they're bright and, you know, even even the Forge one, which I think the Les Alliers is an interesting wine. He makes it, they make a couple of single vineyard wines. This one, which my understanding is not made every year, um, is a blend of usually a couple of Alliers, you know, alive together, a couple of vineyards put together, um, which is really interesting. In fact, what did he tell me? He shot me some information. One um, vineyard called Sawmill Creek, which is on a slope and mostly a heavier gray shale. Shale is what this area is known for, along with loam. And then the other vineyard being one called um, Harvest Ridge, which is a little bit more limestone and clay on it too. So an interesting, an interesting sort of take. So that's that. Let's move on to our next duet. And the next duet uh, is in fact um, Pinot Gris. Uh, Pinot Gris, as the name sort of suggests, is not necessarily a classic white. Grapes are usually more pink in color, as many of you probably know. Um, and very much like our friend Riesling earlier, once again, you've got a, uh, a multitude of uh, geographies over which it's shown. Pinot Gris, to me, by its definition and its name, is very different than what most people drink. If, if we're sitting here scratching our heads this morning at John's slide of you know, so many Americans you know, associating Riesling more with Moscato and Blush because of the whole sweet side, you know, most people associate Pinot Gris with the Italian version, which is Pinot Grigio. And Pinot Grigio, which we sell gazillions of bottles of in this country, your typical Pinot Grigio is what one Northeastern Italian winemaker once told me, which I thought was a great wine, is simply Italian for no flavor. Um, and, and we've had a lot of uh, Pinot Grigios before. They tend to be that way. They can be delightful when they're well made, they're nuanced, they're gorgeous, etc. But the other reality is that's one entire different facet of it. The Pinot Gris side of things, which is more of what we associate with Alsace, with more texture and more oiliness and more and more richness um, and, and flavor is a very different animal than that's there. Um, so really, kind of the France and Italy things are kind of the two. We've been talking about benchmarks before, the benchmarks that you have. Um, California is kind of all over the place. Um, you have them that are that are richer and, and, and stuff, but you have some people that are clearly doing more Pinot grigio esque things. But what I think is really interesting about what our friends are doing in Oregon, and again, if you're not tasting both of these two, please do so, is Oregon kind of has their own style, which I'll talk to you more about the style there, but it's kind of an Oregon-esque uh, which is kind of a tweener, somewhere between what's going on in Italy and what's going on in Alsace, both in the Willamette, notably, but also in the Umqua uh, valleys and places like that. And then, as we know, under, you know, under different pseudonyms uh, in Germany and Austria, uh, Eastern Europe, in New Zealand, we're going to talk about it in a minute. We're lucky to have the New Zealand wine maker to come up and say a few words about it. So, Stylistically, um, you know, similar choices. Once again, you can put these in wood or not wood. Oftentimes, you put a Pinot Gris in a lot of wood. It tastes like a lot of wood. Um, but if you use it deftly and they're older and all that, they can add, pick up on texture, add nuance, add oxidative notes, etc. Dry versus off dry versus sweet, getting into that same argument that we talked about before with Alsace in general. Uh, but it's certainly there. And like I said before, to me, again, this whole Alsace versus Italy versus Oregon thing, to me, is probably the great dilemma for this grape, which is when people are getting it, they don't know. It would be nice in a perfect world if everything that said Pinot Grigio was sort of crisp, clean, bright, and thin, no. Um, and everything that was Pinot Gris was richer and had more texture, but we all know that that doesn't follow suit anywhere, whether it's with Riesling, whether it's with Zinfandel, whether it's Pinot Blanc or, or Pinot Gris, et cetera. And then um, clearly things like malolactic fermentation would have a big effect on it, texturally, flavor profile, et cetera. And then skin contact, you know, Massa Fessa will have something named. So once again, 
a whole series of flavors that you can find and things like that, such as in my books, but never mind, we'll go to that afterwards. And then we have two examples. The first example um, is from New Zealand, and the second example is from Oregon. So Michael's going to talk a little bit about that, I'm going to talk a little about that, and since we have the winemaker all the way here from New Zealand, I'm going to ask Wilco to come up and talk a little bit about his wine as well, too, when we're done. So, Michael, your thoughts on the wines? Yeah, so first of all, I mean, approaching these two wines, I think the first thing that sticks out, uh, the color. Um, obviously, I think wine number three has, has a touch more color, and you got to remember it's Pinot you know, Gris, so the green itself, you know, has that kind of copper tone to it. Um, so we're seeing a little more extraction. We think, you know, before you even taste it, you might put that in the back of your head versus wine number four. <coughs> so um, I'd invite you guys because I do think there might be just a touch of sugar uh, in wine three. I'm not going to call it an off dry wine or sweet or anything like that, but there's a just a little texture and weight there. Um, I might invite you to, to take one of the rieslings, kind of swish out your mouth a little bit, and start with wine four before you address these. Um, and this is actually a really, really interesting pairing in the sense that, you know, in my head, I have this idea of Oregon Pinot Gris being just a little bit sweet. And, and this one, from, from year out, is quite dry. It's really fantastic. I mean, we're really tasting the grape there. Um, and then, you know, we have obviously a somewhat different style coming from, from New Zealand. And I'll be honest with you, I don't have much of a benchmark or, or idea of what New Zealand Pinot Gris is. <laughs> but I'm not, we're about to get it. Yeah, no, I, I think one of the things that makes this uh, particular event so wonderful is it is underscored international All Sauce Varieties Festival, and I think one of the things we get to do is do that. So Wilco Landers, the proprietor and winemaker, a dry member, he's going to tell us a little bit perhaps about this wine and also maybe what's going on a little bit in New Zealand with Pinot Gris. Uh, while we're doing that, you can be dumping your wines after you've tasted them thoroughly so our team can be pouring the next quartet. While we're doing that, Wilco, talk to us. Thank you. I might just sit down. Uh, I'll find a similar high. <laughs> um, I get those vertically challenged jokes all the time. I'm, I'm really comfortable with that. I'm good. Yeah, no I'm good. Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, uh, 2003, 40 Pinot Gris. Um, Pinot Gris for us in Tar River at Mansboro was uh, actually the first planted variety planted uh, in '79. Um, on its own roots and still still there. Um, we've since taken cuttings from that vineyard because the um, the actual um, well, doesn't <coughs> sorry doesn't uh, isn't commercially grown anymore in New Zealand. So we're one of the few that actually still have that vineyard, and that's purely because of berry size, vine size. It's commercially just not uh, a good proposition for the accountants. Um, we've got uh, we've got three different vineyards, uh, all really really small. Uh, Production generally is about 150 cases a year, um, and uh, if, if berry size and, and bunch size, size were sort of small, we, we wait um, for a long, long time to harvest. Uh, for us, it's a, it's, a, it's a long position in terms of ripening. We want to really get the flavors in the uh, in the wine in the end. So, so this is one of our latest uh, latest to pick. Uh, varieties that we grow, um, and that is really to um, to extend. It's, it's really for us like a like a, like a peacock. Uh, you know, we we want to get everything. Um, so, so we're trying to shoot for the stars for this variety. So we'll always always have uh, residual sugar. Look we'll for the audiences as well as frankly personally for mine and Michael's edification too. Um, is there a lot of Pinot Gris going on right now? Is there a movement to plant more of it? Is this style, which clearly seems to have a little bit more residual sugar, is that what the New Zealand style is? How does this all sort of shake out? Yeah, um, I, th I think we're sitting on a little bit on a limb with, um, with Pinot Gris uh, as a producer. Um, it, it, it has gained a bit of momentum commercially, but still uh, a lot of the uh, um, types of, of Pinot Gris are in the Pinot Grigio style, so, um, so basically drinking cardboard. Um, um, sorry, but, um, we have to watch out for those Italians later, they're going to all come <laughs> after us. And it's, yeah. and, uh, um, uh, so, so, so yeah, statistically um, there is not much of, of this style uh, in New Zealand. Um, it, it does certainly reflect the price as well, um, but um, uh, yeah, we're, we're very much this sort of an individual here. And talk to us just a little bit um, about the decision, to, the, the sugar. Is that something that you do every year? Is that unique to this particular vintage? The, the, the residual sugar 
definitely fluctuates every year, uh, but we will always have sort of between 15 or 30, 30 grams of sugar, and it's purely because um, we, we want shrivel, um, uh, we, we want the higher bricks, we want the full flavor there. We do several picks through the vineyard to get a different profile, but um, um, in, in the end, um, the, the, the balance of, of, of the wine we, we have to find in the winery um, uh, at the end uh, at the end of fermentation we start to combine the different batches um, and, and find um, where sort of the residual sugar sort of sits well in, in terms of its balance. Um, well, we have the luxury of it here, and just for the for our, our volunteers here, can you please make sure that Michael and I get poured a set of wines up front here too? It's always difficult to need virtual wine tastings without uh, anything here. Uh, while we have the benefit of Wilco here, just in transition, any questions about uh, Wilco's wine, uh, Pinot Green, general Pinot Green in New Zealand, anything? All right, can we give him a round of applause? Thank you for coming out here. Usually everyone's kind enough to donate the wines, but few people are kind enough to donate the wines and come as well too, we'll go. we're greatly appreciative. We're moving on to our third um, duet of wines, and that is Gewürztraminer. Um, you actually had a couple of different takes on it um, in Chef Francois' last flight, which I think are a wonderful uh, uh, amuse, if you will, getting into the program as we move forward. But this is a really cool variety too. Um, what's, what's really nice, what I find when you talk to customers um, in restaurants, and certainly masters, uh, people who are going for their MS and stuff like that. The beauty of the varietals has such a strong personality and such a strong imprint. Um, once you've had one and you're told it's a really good example of one, you will never, ever forget the flavor. You know, it's so full of, of terpenes and aromatics and stuff like that. It's really d delightful grape. Um, as I said before, again, you'll notice that in the sort of France, Germany, so many of these grapes have histories in this part of the world, but in this particular case, you actually have to go over to northeastern Italy into an area called Tramen, where they have a grape called Tramina, that um, actually exported itself originally over into the Alsace Germanic Palantine before it got um, serious notoriety, although you can certainly find grapes called Tramina um, in northeastern Italy too, and they're not quite as aromatic as their other counterparts, but they're doing a good job. Um, in the United States, um, there, are, there are various different states doing it. Mostly, you're going to find it here in California, but um, certainly in the Pacific Northwest. We talked about it earlier today. There's great examples of it going on. Um, Oregon, Washington. Michigan um, is one of the ones that I wanted to show you. Um, and that's going to be in, I believe, glass number um, number one. Um, we'll talk about that in just a second. And then the um, Anderson Valley um, is going to be in, in the second glass afterwards. Um, let's talk a little bit about Michigan as I'm, I'm moving over slides. Now, I think what's important for you all to think about to, as you walk out of here, you know, we, we spoke a lot about, you know, and, and certainly the leadership of Washington as a state uh, for American Riesling and, uh, and a lot of these aromatic varieties, but I think it's really important not to overlook these um, other areas. And the two areas that I would tell you to spend some time around, you know, when you get into the tent a little bit later, uh, Jeffrey Dion and always brings out some fun New York State wines, New York State uh, Riesling. Spend some time over there to try what he's got today. There's not a contingent here from Michigan. There was a I believe it was a year or two ago. Um, spend some time learning about these Michigan wines as well. Um, in northern Michigan, in the Upper Peninsula, um, the Old Michigan Peninsula, Leland all they're doing some really, really, really cool things. We'll talk about this vineyard more in a minute. Gewurz is pretty straightforward because it's so personality filled when compared to a lot of the other grapes. Um, there is this, again, dry, off dry thing that we've talked about before and is very pronounced. Um, in the world of Alsace, and you know, very confusing for people. I think a lot of people right off the bat automatically assume it's going to be a sweet varietal. Um, it's got the Germanic name, they sort of default that, and when they get it bone dry, sometimes they are surprised, and then some people who really like traditional dry converged demeanors are equally surprised when the wine that comes off is off dry. So you can play all sorts of things in the work. In there, wood or non wood, we talked about that before with Pinot Gris, aged versus fresh. What's really amazing to me is, um, is people have a tendency when they're putting these great varieties of way not to put Gewürztraminer away. They'll put away their Riesling, uh, maybe they'll put away their Muscat, but it's, oh, I gotta drink my Gewürztraminer fresh. Um, and I think that's an absolute tragedy because some of the most amazing 
uh, bottles I've had have been uh, bottles of converged demeanor that I forgot I had, frankly, in some cases, and pulling them out later. And you know, well, and needless to say, sort of the fresh leaching and some of those characters of fruit that will pop out of there are gone, the rose petals and all that. You're rewarded with an equally sexy and very dynamic bottle of wine. And then clearly a lot of the flavor and personality of Gorge Demeanor is going to come from skins and skin content. So we have two uh, side by side here. The first one um, is local. Uh, our dear friends here up in uh, Anderson Valley with Navarro. Oh, that's the second one, I'm sorry. And then the first wine. For correcting me, is from uh, Michigan. So, um, Michael, your thoughts on that? And then I'll yeah, um, just we'll get it backwards. Okay. So the first one, glass of night wine number three is the first wine is Anderson Valley. I haven't tasted it yet. The second wine is they definitely poured the Michigan wine at number one. You, your sheets may be different, but that's yeah. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. Michigan wine number one, Anderson Valley wine number two. Michael, we have some folks up front who haven't gotten any wines yet. The converged demeanor up front. Converged up front? Yeah. No one's okay. looking at me. Raise your hand if you need it. All right, so oh. this whole section <laughs> here needs a little. A little converged love up here. Um, so while we're waiting for you guys to be poured, um, I will touch a little bit on the ageability of converged demeanor and actually um, the, the great converged demeanor that we have in this valley. Um, my favorite tradition, or it used to be anyway, was to come up here and the first place I would go would be Lazy Creek uh, down the road and I would ask for a bottle of their oldest converged demeanor. These things age like wonderfully, they just get more and more complex, a little more vinous. Um, those aromatics become a little more, a little less primary, a little more broad. Um, just, yeah, don't don't worry about like laying down with great conversion meter. Um, I would suggest though, trying to get wines that are either on the sort of sweeter side, you know, with a balanced acidity, or, you know, things that you've tasted before where there, where there is that, that balanced acid, because the knock on conversion meter sometimes is that um, it can achieve really great ripeness, like you can get a lot of alcohol, frankly, out of it, um, but it is a notoriously uh, low acid grape, so it's really hard to make well, um, but I think we have a couple great versions here, um, and these are fantastically balanced, so the yeah, acid is, is great. Um, you guys have wine? No, <laughs> All right. Well, um, so the first of all, you know, uh, I would take a look at these, and, and again, you know, we have a little bit of color in the glass, um, almost like the Dry River uh, Pinot Gris that we had a minute ago. Uh, so I would note that, like, if someone gave you a glass and said, "Okay, what's that?" Um, that's where you start, right? So this could possibly be one of those sort of copper-influenced grapes. Um, secondly, if you stick your nose in either of these glasses, there's a there's a fruit that for me like really really jumps out. That's lychee, and I don't want to like, guide everyone through tasting, but it's the thing that hits me over the head every time. I, conversion of things is very expressive, and I, it's it's for me kind of hard to miss in a blind tasting. Um, so if you don't know lychee, just go to the store, get one, rip it open, and smell it in the store and then put it back. And then, <laughs> and then, and then go get your conversion meter and let's take your nose um, So for me, this is a really cool tasting. I've never had a Michigan conversion meter before. This this is a fantastic wine. This is, uh, for me, one of the, there's been a few revelations, but this is definitely one of them as well. And then the, to have it you know, next to the Navarro, which is a, sort of a benchmark, at least for Anderson Valley, in terms of how the conversion meter should taste here. Um, it's a wonderful tasting between the two. Um, you know, for me, what, what do we get aromatically uh, differently between these two? Is there one that you know maybe sticks out a little more in terms of um, intensity? Yeah, yeah. First one. And for those of you who are not who are sitting, how many of you have had Michigan wine before? Okay, a lot of you have. How many of you have never had a Michigan wine before? Okay, probably a bit about an equal number of you. Yeah, I, this is this um, sort of was a revelation for me years ago. Um, I was looking with, with uh, my wife Barbara back there. We were going on family vacation with the kids, and I was sitting there actually having lunch with Tina Caputo over there in the third row. And I was sitting there going, I don't know where I want to go for, for, for like, summer vacation this year. We're really kind of stuck. We want to stay at home. We don't want to, you know, go to the place. We have to speak another language and all that. And she looks at me and she goes, Well, have you ever been like to Upper Michigan before the peninsulas and all that? And I was like. No, she has chain of links, no? No. And um, so we, we, she talked to me and I said, well, I wouldn't even know where to begin. She had a friend who has a house in Torch Lake outside of Traverse City, so we headed off. Um, I'm always interested to go on places where the kids can jump in a lake and play around and I can go drink wine, always fun. Um, and I was, I have to say, I was blown away by the overall quality of the wines. And one of the wineries we, uh, we went to was a winery called Old Peninsula Cellars. And Old Peninsula Cellars, which by the way, uh, they also make incredible ciders and apple wines, things like that in 
Michigan fruit wine, ch best cherry wine ever. Randall Graham went over and actually learned from uh, Lee Leeds how to make his cherry wines. But we, we were there and um, we were tasting through, they got the uh, John, the owner, actually was there with Brian Ulbrich, who's the winemaker from Left Foot Charlie, where you have today, but was the winemaker at Old Castle yeah. at the time. And he came out and he brought this bottle of Gewurz to me as an afterthought. And he pulled it up and I was like, oh my God. Um, and I was like, and it's this particular vineyard. It's called the Manacle Vineyard. It's a very old uh, source material, old plant material. Um, and I, I was like, is it me? Is it me? And then I did a little bit of research on it to find that somebody who I, opinion I value more than my own, um, uh, Tom Stevenson, the great uh, English wine writer who's known more for fizz than he is for table wines, but he wrote that, you know, he'd had this vineyard, this wine shipped to him, and it was a Madigal Gewurz Demeter from Michigan, and he said it was the closest thing to Alsace he had ever had outside of Alsace before. So I called up Old Peninsula to get this wine. I um, was informed that the last two years were very difficult in Michigan and they had nothing. Um, and he said, I'll pull some older bottles. I, let me go through and just do a quick, quick library vertical. And so he called me up and he said, I can give you eight bottles of the 05. And it's just drinking beautifully. And I was like, wow, that's, that's so flattering. I said, how much do you have? He goes, a case and a half. And I said, I can't do that to you. I can't. So I shot out another, uh, another email saying, Detective Brian, is it Brian? Maybe do you have some? And he goes, yes and no. No, I don't have any of that wine, but actually when I left to start my own winery in 04, um, the guys who were Madigal called me up and said, you know what, little secret, we planted an extra acre for you uh, from old Budwood materials. He has access to about an acre and a, and a quarter, and he said, if you want to buy the fruit, it's there. So, ah, it's like one of 18 vineyards he worked for the city, wanted to get for you. And so it's old stuff, they get about a ton an acre. Um, it's, it's, it's literally liquid gold, but I think it's, for me, one of the better examples of words I've had domestically. Uh, Left Foot Charlie um, is this particular winery, but Old Peninsula Cellars. He has to call it Manigold Farm because he called it Manigold Vineyard and Old Peninsula Cellars. Sadly, litigated, so such is life. The Navarro, I need not tell anybody here. I mean, this is sort of classic paradigm benchmark Anderson Valley, but again, two very interesting takes, completely different parts of the world, both incredibly, I believe, successful in what they're doing. Any other thoughts? No, no, I, I, I sort of echo the same thing. I mean, these are really successful efforts. They're super balanced. I mean, the acid is there. They're not too alcoholic. Uh, they're, I think they're right around within like a percent of each other alcohol-wise. Um, you know, like I said, you know, conversion beer gives like 16% alcohol with absolutely no acid. These are really fantastically balanced versions. And it's neat to see the commonality between the, the aromas uh, and, and that structure uh, between, you know, Anderson Valley and Michigan, which I had no idea to do with each other. Yeah, there you go, there you go. And then our last duet for you, and then we're gonna get you out of here on time for the, for the next part of the day, um, is Muscat. Um, and this is probably of the varieties that we associate with Grand Cru in Alsace, probably the one that's least spoken about. Um, and there's several reasons for that. First of all, um, Muscat, when you just say Muscat, that's like saying wine or saying cheese. Um, it's like, well, where are you going with Muscat? So, um, when we're talking about Muscat here, we're speaking specifically to Muscat of Petit Grand, as opposed to Muscat of Alexandria, et cetera, et cetera, which I'll talk about in, in a minute, because most of what you have in Alsace is either Muscat of Petit Grand, usually co-blended in vineyard with Muscat Otenel, which originally comes from the Loire Valley, and it's usually that you're gonna find the two of them uh, together. That was introduced in the mid-19th century. But they do have a Petit Grand also in the Languedoc, uh, where they make some incredible uh, dessert wines out of them, as uh, many of you know in the Rhone Valley, where of course the iconic Baume de Venise comes from, so other parts of France. But um, Muscat's grown in Oregon and Washington. It's grown all over the state. Unfortunately, the recent um, Muscat boom uh, has resulted, frankly, most of the new planets in California um, in the last few years have been Central Valley Muscat, simply to keep up with uh, production. But there are some wonderful old vines of Muscat, specifically Petit Grand, around the state. But what's amazing about it is you look at the other here, you know, whether it's in Australia for some of those fabulous liquor Muscats and, and uh, Toki Muscats that they have, Greece, which is obviously the original home, uh, and the true Vin Santo as opposed to Vin Santo coming out of Italy. Um, but in Italy, uh, other places they have it, not just in Piedmont, where it's known for producing vast oceans of Asti, and Moscato di Asti, but uh, the very version you're going to be trying is a Pizzito version out of Sicily, uh, which is your last class, which I would encourage you to drink last, right? Uh, and then other places too, but it's, it's really done well. I thought it would be fun. Um, to show you two different examples. So the glass number, this third glass you have there is actually Chilean. 
Um, and we'll talk more about it in a minute. It comes from Itata in the southern valleys of Chile. So next stop, um, the South Pole, realistically. Um, and then the, the Sicilian one, as I talked about before. Um, clearly, the biggest issue with Muscat, again, if, 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 if Riesling has a dilemma, Muscat really has a dilemma. It's that people don't know what they're getting. So you don't know if you're getting Petit Grain, which is the noble one of the two uh, primary Muscats, Alexandria, which is more of the workhorse one. But then they have Muscat Amborgo, which you know of as um, uh, Black Muscat, uh, which is a very popular one for, for uh, rosé style sparklers, uh, for um, Kuali Museum, things like that. And then they have all sorts of other ones. Muscato Giallo, as you know, is a very aromatic version that comes out of Italy. Muscat R2 is another aromatic one out of Italy that's planted more in Brazil these days. Uh, Bailey, which is a sort of cross red one out of Japan, et cetera, et cetera. So dry off, dry sweet, same thing again. We're gonna have one that's dry and one that's sweet as you're tasting through here. And then probably one of the greatest conundrums, is it fortified wine? Because some of the great dessert wines of the world are in fact fortified muscats. Is it a table wine or is it one of those, you know, gazillions of gallons of, of frothy stuff coming out of uh, northern Italy or coming out of Brazil where it's very, very popular? Um, oak versus no oak. And then in the case of sort of some of these uh, Australian styles, it's a vintage dated or Solera blended type. Michael, your thoughts? Yeah, so um, I don't really need to spend too much time on wine number three because we all know Chilean muscat, right? <laughs> um, no, no, this is an interesting um, uh, comparison. I mean, we really do have a spectrum of Muscat here. Um, so for me, Muscat always has this like really interesting kind of, uh, when it's done in a dry style, this is a little sort of like fresh A kind of earthiness to it. And I think we definitely get that here. I've never had a Chilean Muscat before, but I think this is fairly successful. Um, you know, the, the next one, this is kind of what we always think about Muscat, right? Where it's going to be sweet. Um, really wonderful version from, uh, from Sicily. Um, the commonality here, do we get, I mean, what do we, what do we think about, you know, aromatically between the two? Is, it, is, there, is there a relationship here, same grape, or does it, is it just a completely different animal? I didn't know better. I would have thought that this was a Malvasia from Italy, because mm -hmm. it's not as intense as yeah, no, what's interesting here, and part of that is the, is the whole placebo <laughs> thing, you know, they, 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 uh, air, they do the air drying much like you would for uh, the and stuff like that for 40 days before they, they crush it in tanks, so it, it picks up, but no, it's not that, and also I think when we think about southern Italian Muscat, it's usually Alexandrian that's coming from Lipare or Pantelleria, and not necessarily the Bianco that you see there. The, um, the Itato and Planeta, by the way, terrific producer in Sicily for all wines, uh, much less the Pasito di Nono. But the Itata one is really interesting, and I think you're going to be seeing a lot more dry, you know, there is a, there is a boatload, multiple boatloads of Muscat in South America, in Chile, um, and in Peru, and most of it is distilled to make Pisco, um, as probably many of you know, um, and most of that is Alexandria clone, or old clones that came over with the conquistadores back in the 1500s when they, when they, uh, conquered them in, in South America. But there's, a, there's an increasing movement. Uh, you guys are on the cutting edge, on the leading edge of this dry muscat movement that they're starting to talk about there. Itata, as I said before, is probably about as far south as you get. So you're roughly 500 uh, kilometer clicks south of Santiago and only about 20 from the Pacific Ocean of which your next stop is, you know, penguins in the South Pole. Um, you also have zero protection from the, from the coastal ranges that you have that continue up through the rest of uh, that long, narrow band of a country we call Chile. I uh, also have more rainfall, um, so the farm, everything in there is um, actually dry farm, which is relatively unusual in Chile too. Um, and like I said before, um, you know, they maintain beautiful, bright, natural acidity because of the fact that it's a very, very cool climate area. So this particular vineyard, that De Martino works from uh, dates back to 1975. It's primarily decomposed granite and quartz with a little bit of clay loam holding it all together. Um, it's completely on its own roots. Um, most of, of everything in Chile these days is still own rooted, mucron directly into the ground. And there are some vines on this site that, that go back 150 years, although the lines show the vineyard um, was planted, you know, roughly 50 years ago. So fun take, very, um, very musky um, in, in that sort of classic sense. And then obviously you've got the much more perfumed, lifted, sweeter style there. So just two um, very, very different takes on 
a variety. Um, it's, Chileans hard to get information, and they said they don't make much of it. That was all I could get. So uh, we'll have to live with that as, uh, as their production data. Any questions about um, about these wines or any of the wines? Any questions for Michael or myself? We've got probably five five or ten minutes before I before I turn you loose. Or if you don't, I'll just turn you loose. But uh, if you have any questions, you can play Stump the Sommeliers. We always like doing that. <laughs> don't ask us about Uncorked or any of our friends on uh, TV. Yeah. I just recently had an, uh, the real Favre musket, and it's uh, completely different. It's from Noto also, and I just wondered if you could talk about the Noto traditions, if there's the same uh, sweet version. You mean within Noto in, in Sicily? Yes. Yeah. Um, I, I, frankly, I, I, I'm not super familiar with the area. I was just chatting around with some of my friends, and they, they said that. So I am going to defer to my colleague to my right if he knows anything more about that. Well, you've uh, stumped the sommeliers. <laughs> First question, please. Um, certainly an area that's known and um, uh, you know beyond some of the volcanics. I mean, it's, it's an area that's getting notoriety. I know that from Yeah. Got it. That was just the first question, Michael. What's going to happen to us next? Any other questions? Yeah, over on the far uh, side here. When you, when you get a Moscato, you have to When you get a a consumer gets a Moscato from California, is that going to be a particular uh, clone or selection of Muscat or variety, or is it the total of the era? It's a little bit like the whole Pinot Gris, Pinot Grigio thing, where Moscato to me, like if I saw it on the label, would sort of indicate a certain style, which would be like that of Austin. Um, in terms of clone, who knows, but it probably is going to have a little sweetness to it. Uh, at least I would think that, but again, you know. California, there's no rules. Yeah, uh, the, the reality is is that, that, that to quench the thirst, the Moscato thirst that is out there right now, uh, you can't, you want to be doing it cheap and cheerful and quick. So most of that's going to be Central Valley, Alexandria, which is your big workhorse down there. The more specific ones, like um, uh, Louis Martini's Moscato Amabile, which you can still get at the winery, which is lovely. Uh, the better ones are going to be made with Bianco, smaller quantities, more Frizzante style. Um, and probably the single greatest advocate for Muscat in the, in the great state of California is Andy Guadi, you know, up, uh, and he's working with, because, you know, he's working with orange Muscat, which we didn't talk about, but Flor Barancia, he's working with black Muscat, or Lamborgo for his Elysium. So, um, your general generic Muscat, probably Alexandria workhorse variety, not as much character, but if you do a little bit of digging, you're going to find all sorts of types. And just, yeah. just to add to that a little bit too, that Muscat Alexander was a people grape originally, not a wine grape. Mm -hmm. and, and they like it in the valley because tonnage is everything down there. Yeah. Yeah. She's got another stuff that's only a question. Here we go. Oh no. No, this is not a stuff. <laughs> just if you could expand upon the Muscat. Because there is a producer in Mendocino and there is a producer in Anderson Valley who makes a very nice one. So. Yeah, I, 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 I will take the fifth on ampelography. It's not my specialty and stuff like that. But, but needless to say, there is a grape that comes from northern Italy that is known as Moscato Flor Lanancia, which is the orange flower. Muscat that has this very perfumed, exotic, sweet citrus note to it. Um, I can't tell you, maybe Glenn can, is how it got over here originally. But there's a handful of producers who are, who are using it here. <laughs> Andy Quadi, maybe your colleague in Mendocino. Um, the only other places I've seen it, um, frankly, I've been told, although I haven't had any examples of it out of South Africa. Um, I have had some examples out of uh, Northern Italy, but it's usually mixed in with other muscats rather than bottled separately. And then there are people in Brazil using it for their sparkling wines too, but it's one of a bevy of muscats that they will use in the blend. Any other questions? A couple in the far back. Hi. You hear me yet? Yeah. First thing to say, I really enjoyed the session. I thought that was really was tremendous. Thank you. I'd like to kind of move back to the beginning because we've drunk eight wines and we've probably forgotten about some of the things you said at the beginning. First, I was actually on the Zotzenberg last Saturday in Mittelbergheim and I was drinking Silverer. Uh -huh. And just to correct, sorry, sorry just to put another point of view, I don't think we're poking holes putting Silverer as a fifth grown through grape mm -hmm. because the Silverer has been drunk and the Zotzenberg has been drunk for a long time. Yeah. So they kind of let the, the, the forgotten. <coughs> 
The second point is, is that I don't see well advanced to do Pinot Noir on Frio de Grand Cru in Alsace, on the Hex, the Kirchberg, the Bar, and the, um, the, the third one. So there's actually a Pinot Noir. Pinot Noir is going to appear in the next five to ten years as the sixth Grand Cru grape in Alsace. Now, now the question, this is an interesting one. Three times this morning we've heard, we hate to use the term minerally driven. So this is a question for you two guys. Why do you hate to use the term minerally driven? So it's, it's just, it, you can say that pretty much about any old wine, really, and it doesn't really tell you a whole lot. So if you can kind of step back from that a little bit and really talk about, okay, so it's mineral, fantastic. Like, what, what rocks are we talking about? Like, can we drill down and be like, well, this is kind of a slaty kind of feel or chalk or something along those lines? I think we'd rather talk about that than, you know, kind of this, this catch-all mineral. Yeah, I, 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 would, I would echo what Michael was saying. I think it's become very convenient um, to, to hide behind the sort of um, curtain of minerality as a, as a generality, whereas if you can be more specific, stony, slaty, chalky, limey, whatever, that's more helpful. Having said that, um, and actually I believe that in um, the current uh, new version of the world of the encyclopedia that uh, Jensis has just come out with, she actually tackled minerality for the, for the first time in the whole concept of terroir, so I have not read that uh, completely, I, I have not cracked the cover of that tomb on my desk yet, but I'd encourage people to read it. Um, it it's, it's, it's reasonably amorphous, you ask a bunch of different people what their thoughts are on, on minerality and earthiness, and it's kind of like nailing gel into a wall, it's really hard to do. Um, and uh, terrific to know about the Pinot Noir, I, I was not aware of that, and um, I guess I probably misrepresented myself on the Zotsberg, not so much for poking holes for it, more that it was just simply an exception to the rule uh, that's been there, and to his point, has been around and I figured for a long, long time. A couple of other questions, and I know Glenn's going to give me the, 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 the shoot it down thing, but if there's anybody else who has a last minute question, and again, we have a lot of questions about Muscat, but on any of the other varieties or um, stuff like that, probably not Riesling, I'll defer to John on that one, but anything else? All right. Um, Glenn, I'm going to turn it back to you for any closing remarks and give it word to John. Um, whatever you guys want to do. Thank you very much for your attention and uh, all that. And thank you guys for the opportunity to be here. So, uh, John, you have housekeeping or anything you need to say? I do, I do have a little bit of housekeeping. So the grand tasting starts at 1 p.m. If you are here from a winery, you've got a table set up, or go set it up. Uh, for those of you that are going to be enjoying the over 100 wines uh, that you might taste, um, registration is in between this room and the back, Home Arts Building, through that door that says exit, through the breezeway to your right, where you'll be able to, if you have a wristband, get your glass. Uh, if it's red, not as much. Uh, and then at one o'clock, you can go into the grand tasting. In the registration room, please, everyone stop in. The silent auction. Look at the items, bid them up. Uh, the money goes for the uh, Anderson Valley uh, Housing Association and Health Clinic. We work with both of them through our two festivals. Uh, so please, look at things, bid them up. And Glenn's going to say it, I want to say it as well. Thank you so very much for coming out early this morning. For those of you who showed up late, mm -hmm. <laughs> just saying, next time, 8.30, we really start on time. We may not finish on time, but we start on time. So thank you, seriously, from the bottom of my heart.